Splendor of the King, clothed in majesty. Let all the earth rejoice. Let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide. And tremble at his voice. At his voice. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. Oh, we'll see how great, how great is our God. Age to age he stands. And time is in his hand, the beginning and the end, beginning and the end. For God had three in one, a Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and the Lamb. How great! God, sing with me how great is our God. Oh, we'll see how great, how great is our God. Name above all names. Name above all names. You are worthy of our praise. My heart will see how great is our God. Name above all names, name above all names, worthy of our praise. And my heart will see how great is our God. How great, how great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Just a voice, everyone. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. Well, welcome to Friday Night Bible Study. I am so glad you're here. Uh, we're going to have a wonderful time together as we are speaking about church for last month uh, it's been a while since we've been talking about the church and we're going to continue to do that but tonight i want to give you one bible verse before we pray and then we'll get into god's word the the, the verse comes from first peter's chapter 5 verse 8 it says be alert of silver mind your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Let us pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, we pray together that, God, you would help us to understand that what is going on in our lives, in our world, that there is a real enemy that is threatening your children, the people. I pray that you would help us to understand that, God, that victory is ours when we trust and depend on you. So as we read your word, God, I pray that you would speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so uh, we've been talking about church for the last couple of weeks, uh, actually about five weeks. This is a sixth uh, week of talking about the topic on church. And 
as we recall, the church is people. It is those who are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, which means that the Bible tells us that Christ has purchased the church by his own blood. That means that we are bought with the price, with Christ's blood, that we are all come together and we become a church. So church is a people. It's not a, it's not a place or it's not a building, but it's people of God. We are the church. So first thing that we talked about is that in Christ, God joined us together, all the believers together, to become a temple of God. It's a holy temple of God where His Spirit dwells. That means that church is like people coming together, becoming a place of worship, that we together are the church. We are the temple of God. So we... and. Um, Second thing that we talked about was that we are the citizens of heaven. That means that our destination, the church, final destination, it will be in heaven. We will be caught up together to join God in, in heaven where God himself is the king. Lord Jesus Christ is the king and we are his people. We're going to be in the kingdom of heaven together where he rules over our, our lives finally. And so we are the citizens of heaven. So, and we, another thing that we talked about is that we are the family of God. Spirit testify with our spirit that we are allowed to call God Abba Father. Abba Father, Abba means daddy. And we could call God our father, which means that God describes himself as our father. And that means that if everyone is saying that he is our father, then what makes us is that we are brothers and sisters in Christ. That means that we are in the family of God. The Bible said you must be born again in order to go to the kingdom of heaven. What does it mean to be born again? Born again means that you are born into a new life. We are born into a new life. This is the way that we go to heaven. And the way that that happens is that we're born into this new life, into the, we're born into the family of God. Now we are together as a family of God as we place our faith in Jesus Christ. Fourth thing that we talked about is that the church is like the body of Christ. We are like the body. Christ is the head and we are the body, the church. And so we talked about two important things. Number one was unity, how it's all unified together. Number two, we talked about diversity, which means that we're all different. We, we are all wired differently. We have different personality. We have different gifts, and therefore we have different function. Uh, we're all different in a way, and nobody is above, nobody is less. Everyone is equal to God in service of God in the body. None is is useless. Every part of the body is important to God and it forms the body of Christ. Even the weaker one, even the one that is so weak and that all the body brings a special attention to those who are suffering and those who are weak. And that's what the body does. And so there's a diversity, there's different function in different parts of the body. But you know what? They're all unified, serving the Lord Jesus Christ, loving the Lord Jesus Christ, bring the whole health to the body. We are all joined together, unified, because Christ is the head of the church. And if you recall from last week, we talked about the bride of Christ. I know this is hard concept for many of you, uh, bride of Christ, but what really brings out in the bride of Christ, the church as a bride of Christ, that one day the church will be taken to heaven as a bride, and in heaven there will be a celebration, there will be a ceremony, there will be a marriage of the Lamb. The church and Christ, who is the groom, and the church, the bride, will be coming together and joined together in a, this wonderful marriage ceremony and, and, and the feast that's going to happen. And that is what is recorded. That is a, something that's going to happen in the future, that we will be all caught up together with God and that we will be joined together with Christ 
once again. And so the point of being a bride of Christ is about love. How the bride has love for the church. How Christ has love for the bride. The groom has a love for the bride. And so it is compared as of marriage, like real marriage, like uh, when people are getting married, uh, they refer to the bride as the church. You must submit and you must love the groom, right? And to, to the husband or groom, you say you love as a Christ loved the church. You must show that love that, that is selfless love that you have for your, your wife. And that is the marriage ceremony. It's a unique relationship that we have in God that we don't just have God as someone who we revere and love, but we also love him as a, our own lover. And so we talked about the bride of Christ tonight. We'll be talking about something. It's the last series of uh, the church series, but it's not the least. Uh, we're going to be talking about the church, the army of God. The church, the army of God. I want you to understand that there is something going on in, right now. In our world, in our life, there is what we call the spiritual warfare. There is a battle that is happening all around us continuously. And this devil and Satan is real. As you believe God is real, I want you to understand the Satan and devil is real as well. You cannot believe one or the other. We got to believe in the both. If we believe in the Holy God, you got to believe in the evil schemes of devil. And tonight we're going to be talking about that. But our battle it is battle between the darkness and the light. We're talking about the good and the evil. We're talking about battle between Christ and the Antichrist. The, the thing that there is a battle that is happening is real. And the first thing you must understand is that believe and understand there's a battle. There's a real enemy that is working in our lives that we must encounter and fight. So... With that, there is, we have to become a soldier of God. God is our commander. We become the soldier. We are in the army of God. Uh, in order to speak about this, we find in Ephesians chapter 6, by the way, you must have your own Bible. It is so important to have your own Bible. Without the word, you cannot fight this battle. Without the word, you will not divide the word with truth and lies. Without the word of God. You can never live according to his will. We must have be so intimate with the word of God. So I think it's, you guys got that being in our ministry. We've been enforcing you guys to have your own Bible. It is vitally important that you have the word of truth. So if you have your Bible, turn your Bible to Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to go through verse 10 through 19. So open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 19. And we're just going to go verse by verse. And uh, so here we go. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's scheme. I want you to understand. It says, be strong, be strong in the Lord and, and in his mighty power. This battle that we're talking about, this war that is happening, spiritual warfare that is happening in your life, in, in, in our world, is not fought with your own strength. It says, be strong in the Lord and in his might. This battle must be fought, not with your strength, not your might, but it is by the might of our God. The mighty power of God. This ba battle is won through him. The victory will happen, but victory must depend on God's power in order to win this battle. Verse 11, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's scheme. There's two things. Put on the full armor of God. Take your stand. Those are something that I'm going to be talking about. But for now, I want you to understand against devil's schemes. 
And you go, what is scheme? Scheme is like a plan. Scheme is something that is, is operational. It means that devil is organizing. They're planning. They are doing all that, planning and operation, and, and they're ready to attack. Do you realize that? There is real enemy that is planning against you, planning against the church, planning against your home, planning against your own life, your mind. Devil is there, and there's three goals of the devil. The three goal of the devil is to deceive with lies and doubts, and secondly, divide. Devil wants to divide, so they allow gossip in the church. They allow people to exaggerate and spread lies and false testimony. Why? To divide, because that's his, his goal, to divide. Number three is to destroy. Oh, Satan wants to destroy. He wants to rob your joy. He wants to take your joy. He cannot stand that you're joyful. He cannot stand that you're worshiping God. He cannot stand that. So he goes against your joy and peace, and he wants to rob it from you. In fact, the Bible said he come to destroy and steal. That is the enemy's plot. That is enemy's plan. That is devil's scheme. So continue on, verse 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authority, against the power of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So what is he talking about? Our struggle, our battle, our fighting is not flesh and blood. So you cannot fight this enemy with taekwondo or karate. Come on, devil. Hey, 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 hey. It, it, it doesn't work that way. It's not a physical battle. It's not something that karate, right? It is, it's not even fought with the guns or grenade. It's not that kind of battle. The battle is a spiritual battle. And so I want you to understand, our battle is not against people. Yes, there are people who are evil. Yes, there are people who are influenced by the evil. But we don't hate people. We are not attacking people. But we're, t we're fighting against the ideology of the people. What people, uh, uh, they're so wrapped around their evil and their ideas. And their heart is captured by the evil. And so we fight against the, the battle of their heart that they would lose in that battle, they would surrender to Jesus Christ. So we don't hate people. We should never hate people. We ought to love our, the people. We even have to love our enemy and pray for those who persecute us. So it is not the people that we're against, but the evil behind in that person's mind, evil behind their heart. We must win that battle through prayer, and we need to fight. It's this spiritual dark forces of evil. That's what we're fighting for. So Paul tells us in verse 13, Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the days of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. So first thing, put on the full armor of God. I want you to understand something. This is not a suggestion. He's saying, hey, if you want to, put on the full armor of God. But it is a command. It is a commanding, like a commanding officer. Put your gears on right now. Put on the full armor of God. This is a command that we are given as a, as a church, as a believer. We must put on the armor of God in order to fight this war that is happening, the spiritual war. So that is a command. Second thing, it says, stand your ground. What does that mean? Stand your ground. To stand, it is very, very important to stand. If you see a uh, boxing, boxing match, when people are, t -t 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 you know, they're fighting, who wins? The one who will stand at the end. Just like the battle, who wins? Those who will stand on their feet. Everyone who has fallen has lost. 
those who will stand. So stand is such an important thing. That is a key of understanding this spiritual ar uh, the, the armor of God. And that is that we must do everything to stand. We must fight till the end. We must stand in order to win. That's why it, Ephesians here in this several verses, we find four times Paul says, stand, stand firm, stand your ground, do everything to stand. Standing is the key in winning the battle. We must stand. If you have fallen, you must get up. You must stand up and not give up on this fight that God would allow us to win. So we need to stand. Um, there are seven spiritual weapons that is introduced in Ephesians chapter 6, and we're going to talk about each, each of them, seven spiritual weapons. As Paul is in prison, as he writes these letters to the Ephesians, he sees the Roman soldier walking across, and everybody know, oh, when they see the Roman soldier, you know, because uh, Roman was most powerful uh, uh, people, uh, at that time and the Roman soldier had the right gear and ready for battle and sees that and see that as and he began to describe what Christian must be what church must be and that is to be ready in battle not physical battle but the spiritual battle so he speaks about seven spiritual weapon number one uh, again verse 14 says stand firm then and the first spiritual weapon is introduced, the armor, the belt of truth, buckle around your waist. The belt of truth, buckle around your waist. Now, when you see the belt, right, it is to hold your pants. As a Roman soldier, belt is everything. Belt is what holds everything together. Uh, sort of like, uh, you know those construction people or people who are uh, uh, electrician, you know, they have a belt, different kind of belt. In their belt, there's all kinds of stuff, hammer, and screws, and screwdriver, and all their, their equipment, it holds things together. So it, it, it is very central, and it is very important. And the truth, belt of truth, is not really talking about the truth of Word of God because he's going to mention that at the, later on. But what is truth here is really about being truthful. You know, in Christian battle, you must first come in, in truth. You must become authentic. You must become real. You cannot come to God uh, trying to put up a front, try to act like you're someone you're not. You must come as you are. And we need, that is the, what holds you together, just like a belt. It is the central thing that we must come to God in honesty, that we must come to God in genuineness. We must not try to put up a show. We need to come to God as we are. The belt of truth is the key in the battle and that we must come to God in humble genuineness and humility and then this breast place of righteousness the breast breast place is something that you covers your chest area and that is very important because vital organs are all in here this is where we could breathe and there's an organ that pumps all the blood uh, circulating in your heart uh, in your whole body it is a very central place it, it, it is it must be protected and so the breast place of righteousness righteousness breast place of righteousness that we are righteous before god that we are holy before god the holiness so what are we talking about here are we not holy are we not righteous yes listen to me jesus declare that you are righteous before God. But you are holy before God. Right now, you are. I want you to understand something here. That God has already made you perfectly holy before God. Perfectly righteous before God. Then, do I have to do right? What if I 
do wrong, if I, if I sin and I, I do that, and, and so what do I do? I want you to understand something. You're perfectly right before God. You're per- perfectly holy before God. But I want you to understand something, that you also have to practice. Positionally, you are holy before God. Positionally, you are righteous before God. But because we are righteous and because we're holy, we must practice that. And that that is what we're doing. We are not doing it in order to be holy. We're not doing it to be righteous. We are already. Therefore, live in your identity. to, To live in the holiness and to live in the righteousness. And so we are some, there's something that is already done and is being done now. And that is already done. Positionally, you're right before God. You're holy before God. But there's a practice, something that yet to be done, and that we live according to our identity and what God has declared. And so it is important. In the battle, you must guard your righteousness. Your holiness is going to be the key in the battling. If the enemy began to point fingers in your sin and your willful sin that you continuously engage, then you cannot stand. So therefore, our position is already done by the Lord Jesus Christ and that we are righteous before God, that we are holy before God. But the practice is must be done now as we live according to our position that we practice holiness and practice righteousness. And the holiness is a key because the enemy will come after your, your sinfulness and therefore we need to stand our ground. Uh, verse 15. Um, and with your feet, feed it with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. He's talking about the feet, and it is very important. The Bible says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Behold, I'll be with you till the end of age. This is what Jesus has spoken after resurrection, before he was ascending into heaven. He says, go. And how are we going to go if our feet is not ready? Feet is very important that it takes us places, right? And how beautiful beautiful are those feet that brings good news. We have to go and speak about this gospel of peace. God is not mad at people. God is not angry at people. God does not condemn people. God wants to forgive and restore and reconcile with humanity that we become his children. So this is the message that we bring with our feet. And our feet must be protected and we must go. In the battlefield, feet is important because how are you going to stand? As Paul speaks about to stand, firmly stand. When everything else you've done and then stand, how are you going to stand without the feet? Are you going to stand on your hands, on your head? It is our feet that puts us and, and keep our ground. Okay, let's go on. Verse 16. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith which you, with which you can extinguish all the flames, flaming arrows of the evil one. So he speaks about the evil is continuously throwing darts and arrows. And so we must have a shield of faith. The Roman soldier not only had the breastplates of but they also had the shield to protect them from the arrow that has been thrown to them. And, and so what, what does that mean? It is faith. Faith is what quenches all the arrow that comes after you. There's enemy continuously throwing at you. Are you sure God loves you and brings doubt in your life? And because, you know, sometimes we feel like we're far away from God, right? And because in the beginning you follow God, but then you begin to sin and you you seem to be fall away. And in our mind, we think that God is far away. I want you to know that is not the truth. The story of the prodigal son. Remember that? A younger son who takes a half, the possession of the father, 
uh, the inheritance and he spends wildly. And then he remembers to go to God. And in his mind, he thought God was far away. His um, father was far away. He thought the father, he cannot earn his love. We cannot be loved by him. And he thought he was so distant. But I want you to understand. The story goes on. The father sees him first. And he runs after his son. You know, his father's love never left him. You know that he was never distant from his heart. But sometimes in our mind, we think that God is far away because what we've done uh, wrong, our sins. And we feel like God is far away. I want you to understand, God is near. God is near. We could come to him. His heart never left you. So we have to come to God and understanding that, that we are truly loved by God and we're not far away from God. We need to pull the shield of faith because enemy wants to rob your joy, replace it with depression, replace with doubt. He wants to take away your peace, with, replace it with hate. I want you to have the faith. Faith is what protects you. The shield of faith. And you have to stand against everything that is thrown at you by the enemy. The shield of faith will protect you. Verse 17. Take the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. Your mind is a very, very important place. That's a really a battleground. And we must put on the helmet of salvation. Knowing that there's nothing could take away my love for God. Nothing could take away the love of God in my life. To understand that salvation is not by my choice, but it is something God has done for me. And that I secure myself knowing it is God who acted in my salvation. Not so much as I acted. All I did was to receive. And he did all the action. You know, the, the gospel is in the history. And history cannot be changed. Jesus Christ died on the cross. And Jesus was raised back to life. And that can never change because it's in the history that it remains always. I want you to understand that the, we need to put on the helmet of salvation. Our mind is, is very important as to the soldiers. And then verse 17, continue on, says, And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. This weapon of sword is very important. Everything else is defense uh, weapon, but the sword of the Spirit is what you fight with. This is now offense, the sword of the spirit. As Jesus fought devil while after uh, fasting for 40 days, he fought the devil not with rocks. He fought the devil not with his fist. He fought the devil with the word of God. When devil pours out things like, you know, make this bread to become, <laughs> make this stone to become bread. You know what? He said, hey, we don't live by bread alone, but by the word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So we see Jesus fighting the devil with the word of God. Word of God is the truth and word of God you need in order to fight this battle. I want you to understand that the word of God is a central is a spirit, sword of the spirit. And the word of God is what keeps you for dividing what is lies, dividing what is what, whether it's lie or truth, dividing what is right motive or wrong motive. The Word of God is like a mirror. It reflects you to, to know yourself and to reflect what you need. And so the Word of God is like a reflection. So we need to, the Word of God as a spiritual battle is happening. And finally, verse 18 says, Pray in the Spirit on all occasion, with all kinds of prayer and requests. Within, with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all Lord's people. Prayer is going to be very, very important in the spiritual battle. This battle is fought with prayer. Uh, and it says, pray in the spirit. Now, many people think when they see this, oh, this means, 
you know, what we utter and, and, and we think of like a gift of tongue, you know, speaking in tongue and stuff. It's not talking about that. The prayer in the spirit is not talking about tongue. It's n actually, it's not even the words that we say. What the prayer in the spirit is motivated by the spirit, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit giving you what to say. Holy Spirit uh, prompting you to pray for certain things. It is it's Holy Spirit doing in our life is not so much the word, but it is by his own spirit. We could pray what he desire, what he wants. You see, the spiritual prayer is important, but many times our prayer is just a request, isn't it? Well, all we do is like, God, help me with this. Do this. Do that for me. I need that. And it's all about request. No, pray all kinds of prayer all kinds of prayer, even requests, even to the things. Um, you know, when I read the book of Psalms, it's a beautiful example of what prayer looks like. And the psalmist, uh, David, the psalmist will always pray and, and says something like this, you are my rock. When was the last time you called God? You are my rock. You're the rock of my salvation. Lord, if I go into the depth of and the pit that God, you will rescue me. In Psalms 28 says, even though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I fear no evil because God, you are with me. How, how that is so different from our prayer. We should pray that way. We should pray and declaring who God is. Not just give me this and give me that. We need to pray and recognize who God is and sincerely come before God. And to understand this prayer, you must read Psalms. Psalms will help you to develop your prayer. And uh, so that's seven weapons. Now, let me just go through it one by one. The belt of truth, the breastplates of righteousness, the feet, feet the shoes, with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace, shield of faith, and the helmet of salvation, sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and prayer. Those seven things are the key elements that you need to put on. So Paul says, put on this full armor of God. I want you to understand this. Satan knows that war is over. He's been defeated. Jesus defeated the Satan's scheme, the operation, their organization. Jesus has defeated the, the devil. Jesus conquered the grave and he overcame the death and he has defeated Satan. So Satan can never go against Jesus. So he goes after the very thing that Jesus loves the most. He goes after the children of God. He's going after you, the children of God. You, the church. He's going against the church. Again, he came. The devil is to deceive and spread lies, divide through gossip and hatred and destroy, robs your joy uh, of peace. That's the work of the devil. And... In that circumstances, Paul says, stand in the mighty power of God that you will have the victory. I have defeated the devil. Now you need to come and fight, join in this battle. So I have already won the war. Now you fight your battle. And as a soldier of Christ, we must fight the battle. Understanding there is a real spiritual enemy now, in Ephesians chapter 6, proceeds after the chapter 1 through 5, and it shows you where are our battleground. And I want you to hear carefully. There are four places of battleground that it speaks about in Ephesians. Number one, the real battleground is your mind. It happens right here. Your mind is to be protected. Your mind has to be fully geared with the, with the armor of God. It is the battle of the mind. And secondly, it is at home. Devil is 
fighting hard in the homes, in the family, to divide us, to destroy the family. And, and another place of battleground is the workplaces or your school, where you spend most of your time. The, the real battle to put on this full armor of God is for you at school, when you're at the, with people. Um, lastly, the true battleground is the church. Oh, devil wants to destroy the church. Oh, devil wants to do that. He wants to deceive people. He wants to spread lies and to divide the church. And that's his desire that we become hatred and enemies to each other. And that the church needs to be protected. Listen, we need to pull on the full armor of God and we're ready to fight this battle because this battle is already won. The victory is ours. Jesus declared the victory. And in Christ, we have the victory. When we trust in him, when we rely upon him, when we pray and we put on the full armor of God, then we will stand in this battle. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we know that in our world, this continuously, Lord, the tirelessly the enemy is plotting uh, evil against us, Lord. And Lord, so many of our uh, people in the church have fallen to depression. So many people are, are fall into division and hatred in their hearts. God, I pray that, Lord, that you would help us to put on the full armor of God and stand up and fight. For, Lord, you are great in, in battle. And you are our victory in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. It was so nice to have you here. And uh, have you, I hope you guys have a great rest of the Friday night. And I'll see you next week.